So with that, um, we move to uh, the next uh, session on our agenda. Um, this is uh, cell and gene therapy and Jim and Maggie are going to be presenting. I love that picture, Jim. Thank you. <laughs> Thank That's you. Jim? Oh, yes. <laughs> wait a minute, wait a minute. That sure is Jim. <laughs> That's the picture I sent to Solano College when I was first hired there. So I was teaching uh, as a lecturer at University of California, Santa Cruz and non-tenure track. And so this tenure track opening uh, opened up and I got it and they wanted a picture and that's the picture that I sent. <laughs> so I thought I'd use. Uh, what I'd like to talk, to the, talk about today is a grant that Maggie and I are on and Maggie is going to really tell you about the grant. I'd like to set you up and tell you about what we've learned about cell and gene therapy products. And any way you slice it, you see this exponential growth in the number of companies and the amount of money being made, the number of products, and also a corresponding need for an increased workforce. And they're, they're already sort of seeing a shortage. And so what we all have to do is sort of adapt our programs to teach students the skills and knowledge required to go into the manufacture of cell and gene therapy products. And these are really remarkable. And what I usually show is this video that uh, tells the story of Emily Whitehead, who was the first child, the first pediatric case uh, to be treated with CAR T. And here she is uh, facing certain death. She was about to die within the month and they took out her white blood cells, genetically engineered them, grew them up, expanded them, put them back in. And uh, she was saved from certain death uh, by this technology. And here she is one year cancer free. And then every year she takes the same picture. And uh, the last one I saw, she was nine years cancer free. And at the nimble meeting, I, I got a chance to meet her and uh, her, uh, father is now a speaker and founded the Emily Whitehead Foundation. But I always like to, to start with a patient story to really show why we're doing this. And this is really a remarkable technology. It really is a potential cure for cancer. And really in the past, we talked about managing cancer the way that you manage diabetes. Uh, but um, in this case, it really is, we, we can start talking about a cure. And, and a comparable case here uh, this is uh, Jackson Kennedy, and he's profiled in this movie, Unnatural Selection, that is on Netflix. It's a four-segment show that I recommend. I especially recommend it because I have a cameo in segment two. Uh, so, mm. and, yeah, so uh, you, you, can, you can see me looking studious in, in the audience. But here's a case where uh, he was saved from a blindness uh, by an adeno-associated virus uh, vector uh, that uh, looks turn up which um, is one of the major products uh, that's been approved by the FDA. And so really what we are talking about here, you add in stem cells, we, we are talking about the blind will see, the deaf will hear, the disabled will walk. That is a real change in treatments where we can alleviate a lot of human suffering. And if you think about a lot of uh, gene uh, genetic disorders, uh, they really are cruel. And so we're going to be talking about how do you manufacture viral vectors and uh, how do you manufacture cells? And again, now we're talking about cells, we're not talking about pharmaceutical proteins. So we're talking orders of magnitude uh, more complex. Uh, tonight, today, we're not going to be really talking about gene editing, although that's going to be important. We really, really aren't talking about stem cells or regenerative medicine. Uh, but uh, those are worthy topics. It's just not enough time to talk about them today. And what Maggie and I have been asking industry, and Maggie will address this, how does the manufacture of these products change or, or, or differ from what we're calling traditional biomanufacturing and what Maggie talked about in the manufacture of monoclonal antibodies and other pharmaceutical proteins? So, so how is this manufacture uh, approach, a manufacturing approach different uh, than that? And the corollary to that for all of us to ask is uh, then how does our 
education and training approach differ to train students and educate them to go into this field? Uh, how does that differ from how we're doing it now to train students to go into traditional biomanufacturing? And so what do these have in common? Uh, both of them produce viruses. In the case of gene therapies, you produce a virus vector and that serves as a tool to get a gene into a patient's cells. In the case of cell therapy, you're using a virus vector to transduce a white blood cell to contain an additional gene uh, that will then make that white blood cell effective at destroying cancer or carrying out uh, another physiological event. Uh, event. And again, uh, I've spent a lot of time at Oakland Children's Hospital. It's the West Coast specialty for gene genetic disorders. And you see a lot of kids uh, that are undergoing a lot of suffering. Uh, some of them are doomed because this is an unmet medical need. There are no treatments currently, and they are waiting for these companies, waiting for a company to uh, develop a, a treatment to, um, to treat their particular disorder. And so gene therapy products, uh, plasmid DNAs, and again, uh, you likely are going to have plasmid DNA somewhere in the process, and that is a opening. Uh, there aren't enough companies that are producing uh, plasma DNA, virus vectors, uh, bacterial vectors, human gene editing technology, and patient-derived cellular gene therapy products. And uh, we will talk about that, and we'll talk about the generation of viral vectors. So viruses. Uh, I remember I had this uh, Scientific American at a BioLink uh, Summer Fellows when Linnea said, uh, walked in the room and said, uh, we can all agree that viruses aren't alive. And I said, aha, I disagree. Look at the cover of Scientific American. <laughs> and so uh, these are called ATMPs in, in Europe, uh, sometimes CGTs here. Um, there, there are several names, but these advanced therapies, and again, the regulation is going to be different than our traditional biomanufacturing of pharmaceutical proteins. Uh, so first, a bit of technology. So we know in vivo that is injecting something and performing an experiment in an animal. We know in vitro, literally in glass, uh, that is in a test tube. Now, uh, really, if you think about it, the injection of a viral vector in order to, into a patient to compensate for a genetic disorder, that is an in vivo um, treatment. Uh, but here is ex vivo, and ex vivo, you take the cells out of the patient, you treat them uh, with a viral vector, uh, you expand them, you put them under conditions where they're going to divide, and then you inject them in, back into the patient. And so a CAR T therapy that is this type of cell therapy is an ex vivo treatment, just to add that vocabulary uh, to our list. And so host cell types, uh, really, you can look at all of them. The two that you really need to know about extracting what companies are doing are HEK293 cells. They're human embryonic kidney cells. Again, uh, it's been multiple decades since this saw the inside of a human. Uh, these, again, are on domesticated cells. They are, they're in a cell line, and uh, I don't really myself think of them as a, a human or part of a human anymore. They have an origin uh, that was human uh, out of Holland, uh, but uh, right now they're a cell line. And likewise, we talked about uh, insect cell lines, SF9, and those are going to be important. Uh, HEK, mainly for generating the lentivirus vectors that are important in cell therapy, insect cells generating the adeno-associated virus vectors that are important in gene therapy. And so that is really how it comes down. And uh, Iso was talking about growing cells either attached or in suspension, and uh, companies are pursuing both. Uh, HEK uh, can be grown in suspension, but if a company wants a fast start, uh, rather than adapting them, they might go directly to a uh, 
uh, an adhe adherent uh, cell culture system, uh, but uh, SF9, of course, will be grown in suspension. And SF9, again, uh, they're a cell line. They are a full on, I think of them as sort of a pseudo unicellular organism, uh, but uh, they have an ultimate uh, origin uh, in this particular uh, insect. And um, uh, AAV, so we can grow AAV in a lab. It is biosafety level one. Uh, the point of this slide is all of you have probably, uh, or, sorry, uh, uh, let me take that back. Although AAV is biosafety level one, uh, the baccalow virus that we're going to use uh, with um, our insect cells, uh, you probably have eaten a lot of it in the, in the last day or so. That is, it's really, really common, no ill effect. It infects insect cells, doesn't infect human cells, biosafety level one. And so uh, really you don't have concerns uh, growing insect cells or growing those cells in your lab, biosafety level one. And cell culture is the key to producing viruses. Uh, remember uh, that Salk and Sabin never received the Nobel Prize. The Nobel Prize was given uh, to the three member team from Children's Hospital in Boston who developed the cell culture techniques that provided the cells uh, that the two teams producing the vaccines, producing polio vaccine could use in order to grow the virus. And so when you when it shakes down, lentivirus is the virus that you should learn for CAR-T and adeno-associated virus uh, for gene therapy. So uh, bioreactors, but um, uh, unlike here, as Iso said, and he did such a nice job, everything here is single use. Everything is single use. Every, every, every component is single use. There are, will be no zero zip permanently plumbed system to produce gene therapy or cell therapy. Uh, all of it is single use. And so he was showing some pictures. I'll show some others. Again, use it once and throw it. Uh, you know, a bioreactor that's lined in plastic and you have to throw it. It's not recyclable. It has three different layers, as Iso said. And so you can't recycle it. And so it goes in the landfill after being decontaminated and it has to be decontaminated. And then wave rockers, uh, these are used a lot in cell therapy. And um, uh, single use, again, advantages and disadvantages. I won't go through these uh, because ESO did such a nice job, uh, except to underscore something that he mentioned that a disadvantage is increased reliance on outside vendors and you worry about your supply chain. And I am trying to get wave bags now. They're back ordered five months. And if you uh, are a biotech company producing a cell therapy or a gene therapy product and the vendor can't come through for you, you are out of luck and you are idle and you, you don't want that. You're letting your patients down. Uh, so scale up versus scale out. So historically a, a scale up was you start with a small bioreactor and then uh, the cells grow. And when they reach close to the maximum density, you move them to a larger bioreactor, dilute them. They divide, divide, divide. And then you scale up, scale up, scale up. Uh, this is a scale out where you have a system and then you just add more copies of that system. And so these are the hyperstacks. Again, they are for adherent cells and you might see these in use uh, for the generation of the viral vectors. Now we do have to worry about uh, biosafety levels. Again, you know, insect cells and baccalovirus biosafety of level one. As it turns out, adeno associated virus, it doesn't produce a disease. It needs a helper virus. It can't infect anyone, biosafety of level one. But the minute that you move to cells that are human origin, like HEK293 cells, you're in biosafety level two. It's not that big a deal. Everyone has to use, you have to put up signage, you have to control who goes in and out. Uh, everyone has to wear a lab coat. You have to disinfect everything. You're likely doing that anyway, but you just have to formalize that process and be a lot more strict in not allowing students to walk out uh, of the room uh, with wearing their, their lab coats. Here's the University of Pennsylvania and Novartis cell therapy. 
uh, suites and you have these rooms like this uh, with a nice view of industrial Philadelphia and uh, you have uh, eight of these rooms and this is where uh, uh, the patient cells come in and you manipulate them and then you put them in a, a, a closed system in a closed bag take them to a central area where uh, you put them on a wave bioreactor and the cells will uh, then expand. There's unique regulations for cell therapy products and gene therapy products. And uh, within CBER, the Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research is the Office of Tissues and Advanced Therapies, OTAT. And those are, uh, th that is where you would apply uh, for approval and uh, six different guidance documents were published all at the same time in January 2020. And I have my students go through those original uh, FDA guidance documents. An additional one was published in the interim. Uh, all of this was tainted by the cautionary tale of Jesse Gelsinger. Uh, Jesse Gelsinger was a teenager who in 1999, he had a, a relatively mild form of a genetic disorder and he was treated with a adenovirus treatment uh, knowing that it wouldn't especially help him uh, but it would lead to knowledge that that uh, would be useful in the future uh, he had a major reaction and he died and that set back gene therapy by about a decade uh, here's what a gene therapy um, treatment looks like uh, and again, you look at the concentration of the vectors by the number of vector genomes. And so this is five times 10 to the 12th vector genomes per milliliter. If you uh, are familiar with virology, you get into big numbers really quickly. You can have 10 to the 15th viruses per ml and really big numbers. Uh, so these are the potential viral vectors, adenovirus, Adeno-associated virus, again, it's adeno-associated virus. It cannot grow on its own. It needs either an adenovirus to co-infect the host cell that it's in, or it needs a herpes virus to supply uh, missing enzymes that it needs for its own replication. So that is a good candidate. It can't replicate on its own. And so that's a good viral vector candidate. And not only can it not replicate on its own, uh, that the uh, company is going to take out the entire middle guts of it, take out uh, additional genes and put the gene of interest inside. Uh, the disadvantage is that it holds a relatively small amount of DNA. Uh, retrovirus and then uh, lentivirus, uh, which is a type of uh, retrovirus, and you can have other delivery systems. We're going to focus on adeno-associated virus again, which dominates gene therapy and lentivirus, which dominates the transduction of the cells that are used in cell therapy. And so here's how it shakes out. Lentivirus and gene uh, and adeno-associated virus uh, kind of ignore the rest. And here's some videos for you to view later. And again, what you're going to do is take the adeno-associated virus and remove all the guts, uh, the uh, what codes for the capsid proteins and what codes for the polymerase that's required for replication, throwing those out. And now you have a virus vector uh, that has your gene of interest inserted and you're merely using the, the adeno-associated virus as a delivery system uh, into the cells of the patient. Different adeno-associated viruses have tropisms for different tissues and you're going to choose the serotype that you use. There are 11 of them. You're gonna choose the serotype that you, uh, depending on your application. Here's a lentivirus and you'll notice a lot of common nomenclature, a lot of uh, common um, parts here. Uh, this is really, uh, you can apply everything that we learned about HIV uh, GP120, GP41, uh, two genomes, a reverse transcriptase, and uh, all of the same parts of uh, SIV, sorry, of HIV, and everything that we learned about HIV, uh, all of that knowledge was harnessed and applied to the generation of these viral vectors. Uh, the first product was Glybera. It's off the market. 
It's the first approved product. Uh, it was comp compensating for lipolipase deficiency. And uh, that was one in a million patients. It wasn't economically viable, but it showed sort of a proof of concept uh, of all of these. Uh, Luxterna is an AAV2 virus. It treats a genetic disorder called Leber's congenital uh, amaurosis. Uh, that is the disease that uh, Jackson Kennedy, the young man that I showed up front had, and it causes progressive blindness. It delivers a normal copy of the gene. You inject it directly into the eye. You do one eye and then wait a month, do the other eye. Uh, what's the catch of curing these diseases? Of $425,000 per eye. And so there's a bit of a, shicker, uh, a sticker shock uh, for all of these products. Uh, so Lesma, an engineered AAV9 vector that serves as a treatment for spinal muscular dystrophy, atrophy. The vector replaces the survival motor neuron one gene. Uh, cost one treatment, $2.1 million. Okay, so that's a lot of money. Uh, how do you justify uh, charging that much money? Well, uh, the comparison is how much does it cost for you not to treat a disease? Someone who isn't being treated for that disease is going to slowly degenerate in a way that is the, the most expensive way possible of uh, requiring multiple hospitalizations and then 24 hour health care, uh, home care, and then a hospice and uh, just chewing through uh, the healthcare dollars. Uh, remember, biotech products uh, look expensive. Uh, all of our protein pharmaceuticals look expensive, but if you compare even an expensive pharmaceutical product to a single night, to the cost of a single night of hospitalization, you're likely gonna save money. If you can save a single night of hospitalization, you're likely gonna save money. So the way that you produce a virus in an insect cell is you're going to take baculoviruses and you're going to take three separate baculoviruses and co-infect a single cell bringing all of these genes in. You bring all of the genes in from either three or four places. Uh, you can also uh, transfect them, that is use the raw DNA and get them in. Uh, why do you use three or four separate sources? Well. The, the strategy here is you do not want all of these genes to accidentally repackage into a single viral particle. And so by doing this, you're supplying an important um, enzyme, an important polymerase. You're supplying the, from a different source, you're supplying the DNA that codes for the capsid protein you're supplying the gene that you want to get in and that is going to be packaged. And in that way, you have minimized the chance of co-packaging all of the viral components. Now, what you can do is genetically engineer your insect cell to contain these and then just add your transgene uh, and have that packaged. Uh, here's another way to do that. And uh, again, you can do this with uh, uh, HEC293 cells and grow them in a bioreactor. Again, it's all going to be disposable. So here's what you do. You have a virus a cell bank or a virus frozen bank, a master cell bank, and a, a, a master cell bank, and you thaw those and you mix them together and the uh, virus uh, infects the, the cell of interest. You divide, divide, and then what you're going to do is break them open, break open the cells using a detergent uh, in the bioreactor, and that throws a ton of DNA and makes a bunch of snot. So you use a commercial DNA ACE called benzenase, so deoxyribonuclease, that digests the DNA into nucleotides. You clarify it and then purify, purify, sterile filter, and it goes in the vial. And uh, how do you uh, isolate adeno-associated virus? Well, there is an affinity column. These are expensive. Uh, they're even more expensive than protein A, uh, but again, they give you a really, really good purification. And what they are is camelid, uh, that is from Yama's uh, antibodies, uh, unlike IgG, which is four 
polypeptides and two antigen binding sites. Camelid um, antibodies have a single binding site. And you actually use a portion of it that's covalently bonded to your resin bead and you pass your virus through with the impurities and the impurities flow through the virus binds you change the pH just like in protein A and that elutes your pure virus. So let's switch to CAR T and this is sometimes called vein to vein. Uh, so, far, so far CAR T is not a frontline treatment. You don't a patient isn't, isn't diagnosed with, now it's all leukemia, isn't diagnosed with leukemia, and then you say, oh, let's treat them with CAR T therapy. They have to fail chemotherapy, and so they've failed it at least two times, an average of five, maybe failed chemotherapy 11 times. That is, they were diagnosed with leukemia, uh, they were treated with nasty chemotherapy and all the side effects, the chemotherapy was knocked down, but they're Leukemia cells evolve their way around the chemotherapeutic agent, comes roaring back, uh, and they're a month away from death. And then, okay, now you're eligible for CAR T. And again, what's the catch with CAR T? Half a million bucks is the treatment. So uh, now, if you think about it, your raw materials are the patient cells. You're extracting the patient cells, and your raw materials are really variable. They've been those cells have been beat up by 11 chemotherapy treatments. Sometimes they're so beat up you can't even use them and you tell the patient they're sorry. Uh, the the, the uh, patients might be elderly and so your raw materials are really variable. You have to chill them, perhaps freeze them. There are cold chain considerations. And in, uh, in uh, uh, autologous uh, CAR-T, you're, you're gonna have to grab it from a patient and then keep track of it and put it back into the same patient. If you put it back in a different patient, uh, then there are primed white blood cells to go around that patient's body in a graft versus host reaction and to do real damage. And so you need chain of custody and chain of identity all through. And there are primary importance. And you're on the clock, time is of the essence. The patient can't wait. You, you're going to take it out of a vein and then, uh, manipulate it, put it back in the vein. The patient's gonna die within a month. You're on the clock. You've gotta get it back there within a month. If you make a mistake, if you contaminate your sample, the patient's dead. Uh, so uh, here are some of these. And again, half a million bucks about, uh, these are approved products. And notice several of them were approved this year. And there are many, many of these uh, in the pipeline. So autologous, again, it's vein to vein, you take, uh, blood out of the patient and there's a technique called apheresis or leukophoresis and it pulls out the white blood cells and uh, puts the red blood cells back in. You again either chill those or freeze those, uh, send them to a company, uh, they isolate them using a uh, technique with antibodies usually atta attract attached to magnets and you pull them out with magnets and then you activate them uh, that is, you get them going, you trigger them, uh, and then they divide, divide, divide. You put in the um, lentivirus uh, and uh, you transduce them. The lentivirus introduces the gene for the chimeric antigen receptor. And uh, that is on now on the surface. And then you put them in a wave bioreactor and uh, expand them, expand them, expand them, uh, freeze them, mail them back to the patient. and the physician uh, puts them back in and then the patients um, the patient has been prepared with chemotherapy that knocked down their own uh, remaining white blood cells and made a bunch of niches for these new CAR T cells to come in uh, the CAR T cells then go around the body destroying the uh, the uh, cancer cells and uh, the patient something like 85 percent of the time goes from certain death at the end of the month to tumor free at the end of the month. It, it, it really is this remarkable thing. And uh, what's the catch? Half a million dollars. So uh, how are you going to cut down that expense? Well, it'd be nice if you could bank these and allogeneic, you take the, car, the, the T cells from a healthy patient and then you uh, genetically manipulate those and you genetically manipulate those to lose the markers of that donor 
and to uh, go after a certain type of cancer and you expand them and then you can freeze them and then uh, out of that one patient get 50 different doses and put that 15 different, 50 different doses in 50 different patients. And that would be nice. Uh, so here's the chimeric antigen receptor. We're on the fourth generation and it really is a tour de force of protein engineering where different pieces of different proteins are, uh, hot, are, are put together. And of course, uh, this is injected in the RNA form of the gene form, and then the cell displays it, makes it, and displays it on its own surface. So now you have a T cell uh, that has a specific recognition area for that particular cancer. You activate them, you expand them, they're ready to go, and then you inject them in the patient, and each cell then can kill uh, a thousand uh, cancer cells. Now, so far it's only leukemias, which are more uh, accessible to the um, T cells. It isn't clear that this is going to work in solid tumors. Everyone thinks that it will, but the, the real success so far and all the approved products are in leukemias. And here's the lentivirus again that you use to get this um, sequence into the cells. And uh, here's what apheresis looks like. And then magnetic labeling, you pull out uh, T cells by using their uh, specific uh, cell surface proteins and antibodies against those. And then you activate them uh, again with a magnetic bead that you later can pull out and uh, transduce them with lentivirus, the vector, uh, the, the amount of virus that you put per uh, white blood cell uh, is um, important. Uh, you grow them up. I again, it's all single use. And then you cryopreserve it, send it back to the physician, and they put it in. Again, allogeneic CAR T, you might be able to save money there. You have a healthy donor uh, that donates it. Now, Single use, you can buy this, uh, Clinimax Prodigy. It's all closed, it comes in. Uh, all of these bags are already hooked together. Uh, you as a technician hook them up and just feed them there. You inject your cells and it takes it through the whole process. You walk away and here's your barcode, barcode reader to make sure it gets into the right patient. Now, what does it look like to do quality control on this? What does a product, what are the critical quality attributes uh, to this? Well, these are still emerging, but you're going to have to prove that your product is pure and especially that your product is sterile. Now, that's pretty tricky because usually for a run of the mill, uh, for a traditional uh, biomanufactured product, you're going to take a sample of the product of the final product and incubate it for 14 days in rich media to see if anything grows. You don't have 14 days. You don't have 14 days. So you have to use alternate uh, sterility tests and you're going to incubate it for 14 days. But uh, part of that incubation period is you, the cells are on, on the plane on the way to the patient. And uh, so you're going to test all of these. And uh, let me get to how, how do you enumerate the number of viruses. How, how do you tell how many viruses that you have? Well, you can look for one of two things. Viruses are nucleic acid and viruses are uh, protein. So you can look for the nucleic acid or the protein. Uh, if you look for the nucleic acid uh, here, uh, this looks good because uh, you have three capsid proteins and you should have a 10 to one to one ratio. Okay, that looks good. Uh, there's a trick because uh, a percentage of your viruses are not going to have DNA in it. They're empty capsids, and you have to pull those out. And so it's tricky. How do you pull those out? You can use ultracentrifugation, uh, the same way that we talk about with the Messels install and density centrifugation. Uh, this is what our friends at Biomarin near me do, uh, although really this should be analytical and not preparative. And that's what empty looks like under a transmission electron micrograph, that's what a full capsid containing DNA looks like, and you wanna minimize those. How are you going to uh, tell how much DNA you have? 
uh, that is how many viral genomes you have, you can use a quantitative PCR. Uh, or the standard that's emerging is DD-PCR. Uh, I've seen it now drop digital with these inverted. And uh, this is, you carry out PCR, but uh, the machine using ultrasound breaks up your PCR mixture into little drops, and then it counts the number of drops uh, that amplify positively. And by doing the statistics, it'll give you the concentration of your viral genome in uh, that mixture. Again, if you wanna look at protein, you look at ELISA. Uh, so uh, you're going to, like any product, subject it to about 100 uh, quality control tests before you put it out and looking for different impurities uh, with all of these different um, methods and especially you want to know that it's sterile and that there aren't uh, adventitious viruses uh, along the way. Uh, good, okay, and this is what the final product looks like, again, with uh, the number of viral genomes, uh, and a patient is going to get, uh, depending on the product, uh, uh, many viral genomes. Uh, from here, let me turn this over to Maggie and, uh, uh, hopefully you'll bear with us that uh, we won't rush her and she'll talk about our our project. Thank you, Jim. I'm just going to share my screen. Okay. So I'm going to, for the next five or seven minutes or so talk about our Nimble project. Um, it's called WeBet, Workforce Expansion in Biomanufacturing and Emerging Technologies. Of course, Jim wrote this grant and came up with that acronym, which, you know, as Jim can do. Um, it's Nimble funded, as I mentioned. And for those of you that are not familiar with Nimble, Nimble is one of 16 manufacturing USA institutes dedicated to um, advancing the biopharmaceutical field by um, research and development and uh, skills training. NIMBLE stands for the National Institute for Innovation in Manufacturing of Biopharmaceuticals. Um, these are the partners on our, our project. And we have myself and Jim who are leading the grant and Russ Reed at Forsyth Tech. Izzo that you met already from Quincy College in Massachusetts. Uh, we have Dominique and Barbara from Mina Costa uh, in Oceanside near San Diego, and Louise, who's on the um, workshop from Shoreline Community College. So Jim likes to say that he got together, you know, some of his friends and, and started this project, but it was much more strategic in that, as you can, than that, as you can see from this table on the right. This is the top USA biopharma clusters uh, in the nation in 2021. I guess it, it shuffled a little bit because of the pandemic and, and the production that that brought about. But um, as you can see in this top 10 regions, all of our um, areas are represented in, in this. And this kind of follows also the cell and gene therapy landscape with Boston and San Francisco sort of vying for number one for cell and gene therapy and um, Seattle, Philly and North Carolina um, and the other positions. So this is an overview of the project. Um, we hired John Carice, who's a labor market expert to do some labor market research in this industry sector. And we are creating a labor market report um, we want to develop skill standards and curriculum to train technicians on the skills that Jim just described. And um, whenever we do that, as you know, the first place we go is our industry partners. So we hosted six industry listening sessions in each of the regions where we invited our regional industry partners in um, to review skill standards and help us develop this curriculum. We're going to use that to compile new skill standards for cell and gene therapy technicians. And we're going to focus on upstream processing, downstream processing and analytics. And of course, as Jim just described, these are quite different in gene therapy versus cell therapy. So we'll have a set for each. 
Um, and then the plan is to host face-to-face -face train the trainer sessions. Um, that may give way to more online workshops and that's still being discussed. And then we will um, use the curriculum to develop courses and, and disseminate it to um, you know, biotech programs across the country through Innovate Bio and NBC too. Um, I won't go into too much detail here, but in the interests of time, but we spent a long time um, developing the methodology to really look at the labor market for cell and gene therapy, because we wanted it to be specific to cell and gene therapy technicians. So with the help of John Carice, we came up with these search criteria um, to get the, the data that we wanted. And basically, uh, searching burning, we use burning glass um, to search 2020, um, the year 2020 um, job postings from cell and gene therapy uh, companies in our five states. And from that, we're able to garner this information, this data, the education level and experience the employers were looking for, um, the top employers that were uh, hiring in those states, the top titles posted and um, the skills that they were looking for. Um, and then we're able to look at a trend line for the demand for these technicians over the past 10 years. Um, this is, these next few slides is data we generated for California, just an example, but we generated this data for all five states. And this just shows you the job titles that were most in demand for cell and gene therapy companies and the education level advertised. And you can see here, um, it's mostly bachelor's degree. And this is again for California. We have high school and vocational training and associate's degree. But keep in mind that the, the, the industry sector is still young. Most of, of these technicians are working in discovery research or in, in clinical production. Once this moves forward and matures a bit to commercial biomanufacturing, we will see an increase in demand for associate level scientists. And that was part of the impetus for uh, Jim writing this grant and us working on this project was to um, train this workforce that we know is coming in the next uh, three, five, 10 years. Um, experience required, uh, zero to two years. So um, there's such a demand that they, they want you know, people straight out of school and they're willing to train on the job as well. Um, these are the top desired skills, just as you might expect. Molecular biology, cell culture are the two that, that always sort of come to the top. Biology experiments, quality uh, assurance, cell biology, biotechnology, and flow cytometry. And... Um, this is the, the trend in um, job postings over the last 10 years. And you can see the trend is very similar in all the states that we looked at and where you see uh, an increase, as, as Jim would say, this is in the exponential phase uh, of the demand. And it's only going to keep growing as, as these um, uh, therapies get out of the clinic and into the manufacturing stage. And the trend will continue. So this is predictions for the next 10 years, 2020 to 2030. And even high, low, high, mid and low predictions, we see the workforce, the demand tripling from 2020 to 2030. And this is a quote that we saw similar ones time and again as we read articles on the workforce shortage for cell and gene therapy companies. One of the largest gaps is in the manufacturing. Advanced therapies really started to become industrialized in the past five years and talent in the manufacturing and technical operation spaces are in high demand. There's not enough people. There's not enough technicians to fill the needs of these companies. So Jim talked a little bit about this already, but how do emerging technologies differ from traditional biomanufacturing? So that's the question we posed to our to our industry SMEs when we brought them together. And these are the companies um, that we brought together. So these are each of the six colleges that hosted an industry subject matter expert listening session and the companies that we brought in. 
And bearing in mind, we had 27 companies involved and three educational institutions. And many of those companies actually brought two, three, four scientists to the table from different departments. Um, so we have um, gathered a wealth of information from these companies. We had Spark Therapeutics with Pfizer um, at, at Russie's uh, listening session in, in North Carolina. Um, so we had a lot of, of the big guys involved as well. Um, Cytiva up in, in Boston. And what we asked them to do was to take the traditional biomanufacturing um, biopharmaceutical protein drug um, skill standards that NBC2 had developed and tell us what was missing, what was missing there for cell and gene therapy, what was the same, but what should we be adding to those skill standards? And this is going to allow us once we combine and sort that data, and we're doing that right now, is to come up with skill standards for gene therapy technicians, uh, including critical work functions for upstream processing, downstream processing and analytics, and do the same for cell therapy technicians. We also asked the SMEs, um, what components should we add to a course if we're teaching um, or if we are training technicians for the gene therapy sector? And similarly, what should we add to a course or courses for a cell therapy technician? Um, and those were open-ended questions. And we got really great information back there, back from that as far as what was important, what foundational knowledge do they have to know, what hands-on skill, skills would be preferred or desired, uh, and again, for analytics as well. Um, we also asked about employability skills. There are some differences there, as, as Jim mentioned, the, the criticality of what technicians are doing in, in cell therapy. Um, many of the SMEs indicated that it's not for everyone. It's, it's high pressure. It's basically a patient's life in your hands, if you like, as you manipulate and grow their cells. Um, and we also asked them what equipment we would need uh, to teach cell and gene therapy. Um, so, as I mentioned before, this is some of the outcomes from what, the open-ended question for teaching gene therapy. And um, as far as uh, foundational knowledge, uh, just understanding the landscape of, of, of gene therapy and, and biomanufacturing and so on, I won't go through these. And again, the lab skills aseptic technique always came up almost like number one. They have to have perfect aseptic technique. They have to know cell culture, um, <clears throat> single-use bioreactors, uh, aseptic connections, just what you would expect from what Jim just sort of went over as far as the manufacture of, of these therapies and some new analytical techniques, including you know, qPCR and digital droplet PCR and understanding potency assays as well. It's not enough just to say, we, we have a virus that can deliver a gene. You have to do the assays that shows that you did deliver the gene, made the protein, and in that cell, the protein was active. Um, so those potency assays are important as well for gene therapy. And similarly for, for cell therapy, understanding the nuances of the regulatory environment for, for these advanced therapies. Um, <clears throat> And again, um, immunology being a big foundational uh, knowledge component for cell therapy. Um, and they um, also stress the importance of knowing cell biology, understanding cells and what keeps cells happy and, and growing well. Um, that's critical, of course, for cell therapy. And the next steps for, for our project then is to compile these uh, new skill standards for cell therapy and for gene therapy and um, develop curriculum that we hope to teach to either hands-on uh, workshops or online train the trainer workshops that will be coming up in the fall, we hope. So that's where we are right now. Um, and I'll pause there because I know we're over time and see if there's any questions. I have one question. Oh, I'm sorry, Courtney, go but ahead. go ahead. Go ahead, Linnea. So, because I knew they were, so I will go ahead and do Pornima's part. Thank you so much for an excellent presentation. So quick question. 
Are there any thoughts about when there'll be a change concerning when a person can, can get this therapy so they're not waiting until they're like in stage four, since that does lead to technician stress considering how fast they have to turn this around for a patient? I don't have a good answer for you. 